in the jungle by a river that leads to nowhere. There lives a race of people who are covered with hair. They forage and run from prehistoric beasts. Big awesome veggies are what make up their feast. Flint makes the fire that protects them some. Fire is Ota in their native tongue. To them a big lighter is a magical thing. Oganza be Sasa is what all of them sing. Oganza be Sasa, that means big magic. Oganza be Sasa, to lose it would be tragic. Oganza be Sasa, did you hear what I said? Oganza be Sasa, it inspires dread. Around this land are crystals that can do many things. Some control the flux of time, some fly without wings. These crystals were designed by another race. Altrusians they were called, they could move time and space. Now they are gone and their ruins remain. The crystals still tell when it's time to rain. The primitives don't understand what they do. They hope big magic will protect them from doom. Oh, guns of peace, that means big magic. Oh, guns of peace, to lose it would be tragic. Oh, guns of peace, did you hear what I said? Oh, guns of peace, it inspires dread. Oh, guns of peace, oh, guns of peace, oh, guns of peace, oh, guns of peace, oh, guns of peace. I gotta say, I think you actually tried to be intellectually honest. I, I, I mostly do in this video. And as I watched it, I critiqued and corrected, and will correct many of your mistakes. Uh, I'm actually a Lamarckian evolutionist, I guess. But evolution is a nasty word, and... Uh, it's not fact yet, but you treat it as a religion. You treat Darwin as a god and a belief. And I find this very damaging and dangerous to your credibility. If you cannot step back and look at the whole picture, no matter how twisted a view it might be, then you are pursuing a blind faith. Many people said that Stalin was a Lamarckian. Fine. If he was, he was. I don't really care. Science is not good or evil. A handgun is not good or evil. It's the person who's using it is good or evil, no matter their intentions. In your video, you said that uh, Hitler was uh, was not an evolutionist. Well, I, I disagree. Um, he was. And, and uh, just because you don't agree with that theory or the process of intellectually being honest about it, it makes me see that you are more and more of a, a cultist. That you believe that your messiah, Darwin, can do no wrong. He said nothing that was wrong. He said nothing that was contemporarily incorrect at the time of his, of his, of his period. But then you twist that view when it comes to Abrahamic religions. Like, let's say, Hebrews, the Christians, Islam. These are different, basically different theologies based off the same root system, as you would say. And I would disagree with that to a point. I think they all have a, a certain root element, but ideology is not the same. But you... Do not accept this view when it comes to Darwinism. I find that very intellectually dishonest. And uh, I, I don't know how you can actually not see that. Uh, I, I, that. That is one of the fears of many Christians, I guess. That we see your blind spots, but we don't see our own, you know. So I think it's it's really good for all of us to take a step back and look at our own views and critique our way of thinking. Uh, I have, and uh, for me, Aramaic Christian, we believe that all faiths are intertwined. Even they all have a common factor, like the evolution of language. So did the evolution of belief, and it stems from shamanism. Now, we believe that I choose to believe that Aramaic Christian is the correct one because it's the old, one of the oldest languages out there. It's it it encompasses all belief systems that are around the world and has a, the history of all stemming back to Noah. 
Aramaic script is goes back to the Babylonian, to the everywhere. It it just I find it odd that you cannot accept that there is a creator, which is fine. I I don't choose to hate you or or to judge you because of your belief or lack of belief. I'm critiquing your critical thinking, and if when we stop critiquing each other on our critical thinking or the evidence that we see then it it becomes a blind faith you just accept it because i know what i'm saying you see what i'm saying even scientists have blind faith they believe that evolution is true so they you know then they see what they want to see all the time um i guess that's all i have to say let's watch your video now Thank you very much, everyone. I didn't realize that this event was being uh, hosted by uh, Cthulhuism. I mean, I'm a Godzillist. So. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure you all recognize this picture of James Randi. Uh, all right, so when Charles Darwin uh, published his theory in 1859, it created a schism between uh, those who accept... Yep, come in. <laughs> When Charles Darwin pr- published his theory in 1859, it created a schism between those who uh, accepted the evident indications of science and those who would rather make believe something else. Well, you're not off to a good start. When Darwin posted his findings, quote, unquote, uh, he had no evidence to back this up, and it was criticized, yes, by a few people. You're not off to a good start right now. And when we're talking about Darwin's critics, we're talking almost exclusively about creationists, and it's important that you understand what that word means. Uh, creationist, or yeah, creationist is not synonymous with Christian. There are Muslim and Hindu creationists, and there are Christians, Muslims, and Hindus who accept evolution. Creationism is a form of religious extremism, which includes a degree of reality denial. All the leading creationist organizations post a statement of faith in which they admit that they will ignore any and all evidence that stands counter to their preferred belief. They reject evolution specifically, but uh, in preference to a literal interpretation of sacred fables, but more importantly, they also reject methodological naturalism, insisting instead that supernatural explanations should be treated like science. So we're talking about miraculous magic replacing the scientific method. Is that their term? That God uses magic, and it's, what? Really? What kind of ignorance is that? No, no, I I don't replace magic with science. I replace common sense and data that is given. Two people can see the same thing, okay? Two people can see the same evidence and see two different things. That is all. And, and when you stop questioning the data and evidence that's given, then you have a faith and 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 a belief system. Most people, evolutionist, atheist evolutionists, treat evolution and Darwin as a religion. But uh, what do you, what do you know? And this movement didn't really begin or didn't come on strong until Darwin presented a theory to explain what had to that time been a topic of inexplicable complexity and a safe haven for superstitious mysticism. One of the first criticisms that I hear about Darwin is that Darwin didn't believe his own theory. Of course, Darwin never wrote that and was never reported to have said it at any point in his life. In fact, he delayed publication of his book for 10 years because he knew how it would be criticized and he wanted to... He delayed it for 10 years but forgot to cite many of the scientists and other people that he took their information from and plagiarized. Yeah, don't think so. I mean, it could have happened that way, but I I I really, really doubt it. ...to get in all the research that he could before he made it known. Uh, He said that explaining his theory felt to him like confessing a murder. Uh, This was a man who, uh, because he knew how how he would challenge deeply held beliefs of the day. So this was a man who definitely believed his own theory, even if he would rather not have. So why do people say that he didn't believe it? Uh, This seems to come from a comment that he made about the evolution of the eye. 
creationists commonly quote him as saying, to suppose that the eye with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus of different distances, for admitting different amounts of light and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd to the highest possible degree. And for some reason, the creationists who quote him saying this. Yes, I love quote mining. I mean, atheists don't quote mine religious people or the Bible and not continue on to explain what it really means. They just take a piece here and expand on it, right? After all, you know, it ended with a period. I mean, he was done with the sentence, right? Never include the very next thing he said after that. Yet... Reason tells me that if numerous gradations from a perfect and complex eye to one very imperfect and simple, each grade being useful to its possessor, can be shown to exist, and they have, as we'll see in a moment. If further, the eye does vary ever so slightly and the variations be inherited, which is certainly the case, and if any variation or modif moderation, modification in the organ can be useful to an animal under the changing conditions of life, then the difficulty of believing that a perfect and complex eye could be formed by natural selection can hardly be considered real. Do you think that all those creationists who read that book and quoted that line stopped there and somehow never saw what he said next? And <laughs> he essentially said, I know it sounds ridiculous at first, but when you think about it, and in fact he continues providing three pages worth of plausible intermediate stages between uh, human eyelessness and human eyes, citing examples from existing organisms to show that the intermediates are viable. Of course, creationists don't want to know that. Uh, they want to believe what they want to believe, and they don't want to know any better, and sometimes they'll even admit it. Many times, evangelical ministers have admitted that if you believe that you're just an animal, then they can't imagine how anybody's life could have value. Uh, and if, the, if you pretend that you were magically created by an invisible genie, then you could also pretend that death is not the end and that some immortal aspect of yourself will continue on in some mystical sense. But it doesn't matter if you believe that or not, because many of the leading uh, evolutionary scientists have been Christians and some still are. You don't have to believe in creation in order to believe in a God that orchestrates everything including evolution. If you want to believe that you have an immortal soul, you could still believe that even if the Bible is nothing but old fables and there is no truth to any religion. There could still be a supernatural spiritual rim if you really need to believe. And evolutionists still think that Darwin came up with the theory of evolution when it was actually Lamarck. In 1801, he started publishing his theories of evolution and pretty much mirrors Darwin. It almost looks like Darwin copied everything Lamarck said in his book. Hmm. Believe that. In any case, whether there is an afterlife or not, your life has meaning both for you and for the other lives yours has touched. There is no argument that you're an animal. That is indisputable, and there's no escape from that fact, but it is hardly fair to say that you are just an animal, as if you have no more potential value than mere meat. I've heard professional creationists argue that if we're just a bag of chemicals, then there's no purpose in living. If you believe in evolution, why don't you just kill yourself? Such people, somehow, can find no value to human life, unless we live forever, which of course would devalue human life. So it's not just unrealistic, but it's a sick and pathetic perspective, and, there is, and potentially dangerous. But there is a higher philosophy which can accept and appreciate reality as it is without having to alter it to pretend that it's something else. Even if we have no soul and are finite beings, evolving apes such as we can still experience awe and wonder no matter what Oprah Winfrey says. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt that you've met people like that. Um, I think they're talking about morality. <clears throat> If we're nothing more than bags of chemicals and and meat, um, like any other animal, then 
there's no morality to not use our fetuses, baby fetuses, as experiments which in flavor enhancing crystals. You know, taking their bladders out and using their blad fetuses' bladders to grow flavor enhancing crystals f for your food and drink, like Pepsi did. Um, I can prove this. I, I have no problem proving it. I'll even back it up because I was invested in Pepsi at the time. Um, where do you draw the line on morality? And, and see, religion has a group mentality of morality. We know there's certain ten laws that we must follow. Uh, you'll point out the other laws in the Bible, and those are not laws of God. They're more like workers' right laws, uh, punishment laws, and some asshole laws created by man. There's only ten laws that we have to follow, and seven laws of Noah. We already established a government and a court. So I, I, I really don't understand your mentality of even bringing this up about Darwin. I mean, this is like a, you preaching hate. It seems like you're preaching hate about another group and not even talking about Darwin. And now that you understand what the controversy really is, let's look at the evidence. We need, a, we need numerous gradations from a perfect and complex eye to one very imperfect and simple, each grade being useful to put the possessor. And the simplest example of that is a photoreceptive cell as represented in this primitive protist. Even animals that have no brains and no organs can still have very simple eyes, basically no more than light sensors or light receptive cells with a nervous, conduct, uh, nervous connection. And from there, we can go in a number of different directions. The red cup-like shape at the end of this arm of a starfish uh, equates to a single component of what would be an arthropod's compound eye. So starfish have five very simple eyes looking in all directions. And they are very simple. So if you, if you, imagine, a, uh, if you imagine a duplication mutation, or, or not a duplication but a mutation that results in duplicates, you know. If there are multiplicity of these, they will see better. There will be a natural selection for that. Now, uh, horseshoe crabs are arthropods with two compound eyes and then a half a dozen simpler eyes all over the rest of it, including one on its tail. Another option is to put photo, the photoreceptive pigment cells, or opsins, in a bowl-like depression, so that it, as in this planaria, so that it can detect the direction of light. And uh, if the bowl becomes further enclosed, it becomes a pinhole eye, such as on this nautilus, and it can even focus to a degree, even without a lens. In more advanced camera eyes, the opsin becomes a retina, and the lens is formed out of a covering of transparent proteins appropriated from a previous purpose. The human eye is a wonder of incidental engineering, but it's not the most advanced type of eye there is. The octopus actually has a more advanced eye than we do, primarily because it develops in the opposite order. So the one thing they don't see is the veins in the back of their eyes, we do when the sunlight hits it just right. They also don't have the blind spot that we do that we have to compensate for with rapid eye movements. It is also possible to have the lens fill that cavity rather than cover it, creating the effect of a concave mirror, as in the multiple eyes of this scallop. So we have numerous gradations from a perfect and complex eye to one very imperfect and simple, each grade being useful to its possessor with slight variations inherited, with each modification being subtle and ever useful. So there is no difficulty in seeing how the eye could develop through several successive stages just as Darwin predicted. Now let's look at what else Darwin said about organs like the eye. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed through numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Creationist critics, including intelligent design proponents, are convinced that they've already met this criteria with their various claims of irreducible complexity. And they think that Darwinism has been disproved. But again, those critics seldom quote what Darwin said immediately after this, but I can find no such case. And it's not just that Darwin himself couldn't find an example of this 150 years ago. No one ever did. Between phylogenetics and 
embryology or developmental biology, they have all that pretty well nailed down. Every one of the claims of irreducible complexity has been from, from the, the, the immune system to the blood clotting cascade to the bacterial flagellum, among others, has been refuted by science and now disproved in a court of law. The 2005 case of Kitzmiller versus Dover revealed that there is not one sound example of an irreducibly complex organ or biochemical system which could not have evolved through numerous successive slight modifications. And this trial was big news, but creationists ignore that too and pretend as if they still have a case. They pretend that Darwin didn't believe his own theory and that he renounced evolution on his deathbed. And uh, all three of these are themselves lies, mostly from an evangelical named Lady Hope. Now she claimed to have visited Darwin on his deathbed as he lay dying. She said that she found him reading the Bible and that he confessed his doubts to her saying that he was sorry that he had promoted evolution and now wanted to be saved in Jesus' name. Everyone in Darwin's family, however, denies this. His son Francis said that it was quite untrue and accused Lady Hope of lying publicly. His brother Leonard called Lady Hope's story a purely fictitious hallucination. And uh, Darwin's daughter Henrietta didn't believe that Lady Hope had ever seen her father. She said that I was present at his deathbed. Lady Hope was not present during his last illness or any illness. He never recanted any of his scientific views earlier, either then or earlier. We think that this conversion or story of conversion was fabricated in the USA. Unable to challenge Darwin on science, his critics turned to slander. So another frequent criticism or rather accusation is that Darwin was a racist, that he promoted eugenics, and that Hitler was a Darwinist inspired by Darwin to follow these pursuits. And all of this would be true if we were talking about Leonard Darwin. The things that he promoted decades after his father's death show where he and his dad did not agree. Charles Darwin is often accused of being a racist because the title of his most famous book mentions favored races, but that book does not talk about people and the word race back then meant only a lineage of species. All my life, Christian organizations have tried to blame evolution for promoting racism. But the fact is that the most racist organizations there have ever been were all religious, fundamentalist creationists. In Darwin's time, every contemporary or historic authority down through antiquity was overtly racist, with most convinced that the perceived races of men were separate creations unrelated to each other. Racism was ubiquitous throughout human history. And before Darwin suggested common ancestry, both religious and irreligious people thought that the various races of men had no common ancestors at all. Some believed that the different races that they perceived were convergently derived from different species or that they spontaneously generated from separate sources. And we heard this from people like David Hume and Voltaire and leading scientists of every age until a few decades after Darwin's death. And creationists proposed other options. Mormons, for example, said that black skin was the mark of the devil and that black people were descended from the Genesis character Cain. Other people said that Cain found his mystery bride among the apes and that that's where other races came from. Yeah. Uh, others believed that God created other races from other atoms that aren't mentioned in the Bible and which predate anyone the Bible mentions by name. And the modern terrorist group known as the Christian identity hold to the seed line theory. And they believe that the Jewish race began when Eve was impregnated by the serpent in the garden. And since they believe that the serpent was the devil in disguise, then the Jews in their view are literally the bastard spawn of Satan. In another creation myth, the Titan Prometheus created both people and animals out of clay and then breathed into them literally the breath of life, just like the Semitic gods did in Enuma Elish and also in Genesis later on. Then, each, um, then uh, the father god, Zeus, said that Prometheus had created too many animals and that he needed to make some of them into people, albeit with bestial souls. 
So this is the first reference we have to creationists believing that some people are fully human and others are subhuman animals. But this is just the beginning because this theme is repeated again and again and again down through history. Darwin proposed a tree of life where different lineages would be equally evolved. However, Aristotle had already proposed a ladder of life where you had higher and lower life forms. And the public perception blended these together so that you have an evolutionary ladder where one race is seen as superior to all others, not just in specific ways, but in general. And it was so bad that in the 16th century, Catholic missionaries held a debate wherein one man argued that Native Americans were fully human, but his four opponents, also in the Catholic clergy, argued that they were soulless, thoughtless, talking animals in human guise. And this was in the 1500s. So how did Darwin inspire racism and all these people that lived centuries before him? It was not Darwin, but the authors of antiquity who numbered the races and called them inferior. One of the venerable scientists in the history that Darwin would have studied was Carolus Linnaeus. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a greatly respected scientist who lived about 100 years before Darwin. He was somebody that every 19th century naturalist would have had to look up to. He invented the first system for classifying life forms. But he classified humans into six different species, European white people, American red people, Asian yellow people, and African black people, as well as chimpanzees and orangutans. Linnaeus was a creationist. For him, evolution was not even a possibility. He'd never even heard of it. But he was convinced that humans were apes and that apes were human, and he defied his contemporaries to explain or refute that. His descriptions of each of these species praised the white race overall and uh, criticized everyone else as lesser forms. The existence of gorillas hadn't yet been confirmed, and Linnaeus didn't yet know about Australian Aborigines either. But once they were discovered, the Australoid race was determined to be the lowest form of humanity, primarily because they and gorillas were the same color. That's how superficial 18th century scientists were, and they weren't any better in Darwin's day either. Understand that this is the accepted perspective or position of all anthropology at that time. Virtually every European believed that the darker races were lower than whites. Now remember that Darwin had written several books, each of them very progressive for his time. And in all of his collective works, there is only one paragraph which could be interpreted as racist, and that is the one where he's talking in anthropological terms as they were understood at that time with some races universally considered to be lower than others. And remember that everyone in Darwin's world thought this from the clergy and throughout academia. So of course we can expect that you know, Darwin believed the same thing, except that he didn't. If you read his book, his last book, The Descent of Man, you'll see an evolution in his thinking. At the beginning of the work, it, it says what you would expect somebody from, you know, a scientist from his time to be saying. But it This is Ken Starr, and we have breaking news. Aaron Raw's brain has been discovered in an abandoned hippie colony. Supposedly, his brain ran away. Aaron Raw's brain ran away from him because Aaron Raw only listened to his own dumb ass. Fact checking, one must always do that. Fact check, damn commies. This is Ken Starr, and this has been... The Two Minute News. Talk about genetic deficiencies. Isn't that pitiful? Except you left out both of his grandfather's Christian backgrounds. You know, the smart one, talented rich one. As they led the charge of abolitionists during their time, that was a forbidden fruit. They took more punishment criticism, but since they were elite in their field of profession, Darwin's grandfather could have been surgeon to the king, and his other grandfather coined a phrase, am I not a man and a brother? But who knows? Morality is just a learned behavior. Let's see what other bullshit you got.
behind me is a map, and it has a purpose. If you ever heard of the pygmy tribe called the Tawa, Taiwa, everything in green, like it says on the screen here, is their uh, modern territories, their settlements. And that red mark down there is where they found supposedly new species. It's four foot nine. Well, the pygmy Taiwa is four foot nine on average height. Who in the hell puts hair on a skull and smashes its nose down to make it look more monkey-like? Ah. Couldn't it be an answer? ancestor of these tribes? I think so. Intellectually dishonest to assume like fossils. Fossils say two things. Something lived and died. We can tell a lot by the fossils, like the ribs can tell us the age and the growth patterns of the creature. The second thing fossils tell us is that something gets smaller. Mammoths to elephants, T-Rex to the Arctic T-Rex, snakes, centipedes, everything, everything. Except I don't see black anywhere on your list there. I mean, uh, I mean, a nine foot eight certainly make the list, wouldn't it? Well, unless that's intellectually dishonest of me to point that out. How can it be your way is right and my way is wrong? We're not there. There's no proof that there is God. There's no proof that there's evolution is a fact. It's, that is the plain truth. It's all based on opinion. Now, here's something for you. We humans are nothing more than a swirling vortex of particle energy with a higher awareness than germs, plants, animals. So if we humans exist, then it is possible that God exists. There you go. There's a factoid for you. Hmm. Did you know Hitler tried to seize control? Was imprisoned. I think it was March of 1924. Hitler and his other leaders were put on trial. High treason. During this time, he wrote My Kampf. Chapter 4, if you ever read it, he goes deeply into Darwin of both eugenics and Darwin's evolution. Let me read you a couple passages. The strong must rule. It must not unite with the weaker, thus sacrificing its own stature. Only the weakling can think this cruel, and that is why he is weak. A defective man, for if this law did not hold, any conceivable evolution of organic living things would be unthinkable. Page 278. Always struggle. It means to improve the health and stamina of the species, and thus a cause of its evolution by any other process all develop and evolution would cease and the very reverse would take place page 278 Sounds a lot like Darwin when he was talking about eugenics as the work progresses he begins to question the idea of multiple races he said that the word race was inadequately defined and of virtually no value with uh, regarding people he said that human beings were sufficient were not sufficiently distinct to be considered separate races. He said that our biased judgments against other people were superficial and erroneous, that no matter how distinct other people may appear to European eyes, there was no cons consistent distinction because some Africans shared traits with some Europeans, and the same was true of every other group too, so that every race blended into every other race such that it was impossible to determine any clear division. To illustrate this, he noticed how even an expert anthropologists may disagree and classify two members of the same ethnicity as though they were different races. And most importantly, Darwin tallied the claims of other scientists of his day who couldn't agree on how many races there were. He said, man has been studied more carefully than any other animal, and yet there is the greatest possible diversity among capable judges, whether he should be classed as a single species or race, or as two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eleven, fifteen, sixteen, twenty-two, sixty, or sixty-three. This wasn't the only time that Darwin questioned the judgment of other scientists in his field. He remarked that the people of his day were divided into two schools, monogenists and polygenists, and the polygenists were in two groups as well. The first group he described as creationists, those who do not accept evolution and must therefore interpret different species as separate creations. The other group had believed that man had evolved from two or more different species as different as gorillas and orangutans, but Darwin argued that if that were the case, then there would be clear indications of that in the comparative skeletons of men. Thus he wrote that naturalists who accept the principle of evolution will feel no doubt that the races of men are descended from a single primitive stock. All the races of men 
He did not say that one race evolved from another. All of the races we see all evolved from a common source. And in a sense, this is when Darwin said that all men are created equal. Yet, in 1924, decades after his death, Darwin was accused of promoting eugenics, and Darwinism was blamed for the genocide of Australian aborigines. Yet, in Descent of Man, Darwin lamented that that was a tragic episode that was already underway years before he got there and decades before he published his theory. So he couldn't have had anything to do with that, nor would he have. His journals on the HMS Beagle say that Europeans should prefer the dark skin of Tahitians to their own comparative pallor. And he said that the finest people he ever knew were Tahitians, and that the nicest man that he ever knew was a free black African military commander stationed in South America. Darwin abhorred every aspect of slavery and wrote extensively against that. He also wrote against the favoritism of Caucasian invaders and opposed the genocide of indigenous tribes, and he often criticized his own race as contrasted against darker tribes whom he frequently praised. And you have to take this in context. The context being that he is an imperial English aristocrat, aristocrat in a time when, at a time when England was an ethnocentric empire, scowling down at everyone else. They thought they were the shit at that time. So this is completely out of character for someone in his uh, class. And most importantly, we never see from Darwin any of the bigotry that is so common from practically everyone else in history up until. Isn't it the religious view that, you know, from the Christianity standpoint, that all humans are from Adam and Eve? And this is why his grandfather, his father, his other grandfather, and his wife, and everyone else believed that all humans are created equal? All that time, including some of his critics still alive today. Quite the opposite, in fact. His book, On the Origin of Species, offered no support for either racial purity or superiority. In fact, he argued against both. He said that purity led to congenital defects, and he said that racial superiority was an environmental variable. So Darwin was neither a racist nor a eugenist, despite all of the alleged links to Hitler. When you get your information from creationist sources, almost all of it's wrong. So everything I read from, from or about Hitler showed that Hitler had no idea what he was talking about. So I challenged these people making these allegations to show me where Hitler ever accepted evolution or expressed any understanding of it. They pointed me to volume two, chapter four of Mein Kampf. There Hitler mentions evolution and talks about what brought mankind out of the animal world. And it sounds like he's promoting evolution, but Hitler makes clear that he's talking only about cultural evolution. And he says that man's inventions were the ticket, not any biological process. In that same paragraph, Hitler mentions what everyone who believes in the higher evolution of, of organisms must admit. And again, People take that he's talking that he's promoting evolution, but the creationists don't recognize their own arguments in Hitler's words, because he's he's making a, an, an ultimatum here. What we have to admit, he's talking about a belief he does not share, which is why he questions how it all began. And that question is a challenge for those who accept evolution, not those like himself who reject it. Hitler did mention the natural law of evolution, and he equated that to the strong dominating the weak but it is clear from the context that he's not talking about uh, evolution in a Darwinian sense. Hitler also talked about cultural, political, industrial, and uh, military evolution. And the only time he mentioned natural evolution, he was obviously still talking about a socio-political sense. And when he mentioned organic evolution, he was talking about management of an organization. So for this reason, some translations use the word development instead of evolution. Hitler meant, never mentions Darwin's name, and only once does Hitler talk about Darwinian evolution. In volume one, chapter two, or chapter 11 of the same book. And I cited this passage in a couple of videos where Hitler uses the same arguments that creationists commonly do. He says he accepts only microevolution, saying that evolution can only occur within definite limits. 
and that uh, pursue, producing subtle variants within their kind. He said, new diversity can only arise through rare and inviolable hybrids between those kinds. And he said that the emergence of new species is impossible. So Hitler is repeating all these common creationist mistakes, saying things no Darwinist would ever say. And I've never seen any statement from Hitler where he even acknowledges Darwinian evolution, except here, where he rejects it outright. And as I think it's there on the bottom, he even said that evolution was a sin against the eternal creator. We have no way to know what someone's beliefs are other than what they say. Hitler had always only ever described himself as a believer in God, as a Christian, and more specifically a Catholic. But in this case, he made, and he also said that his racism was based on his religion. But in this case, he also made clear Hitler was a creationist. And as further proof that Hitler rejected Darwinism, he, or he banned Darwin's books and ordered that they be burnt. So all of Darwin's critics are wrong again on all points. Hitler's prejudice and Darwin's process could not be any more at odds. But even if Darwin was Hitler, it wouldn't have any impact on the validity of evolution. If you're going to argue against the facts of a science, it doesn't matter what sort of person the scientist is. So Darwin's critics found where he complained about the Cambrian explosion. And this is where there was a relatively sudden proliferation of macroscopic life forms representing most of the modern phyla, uh, all within 10 to 20 million years or so, which is relatively fast in geologic time. Darwin said, why, do we, why we do not find fossiliferous deposits belonging to these assumed earliest periods, I can give no satisfactory answer. And he concluded, the case must at present remain inexplicable and may be truly urged as a valid argument against the views here entertained. And again, the creationists wouldn't know if this was a valid argument unless he told them so. So they seized on that and again proclaimed that evolution had been disproved. The assumptions being that all major phyla appeared suddenly, much too fast to have evolved, that they appeared all at the same time, with no precursors, and they imagined this to be the moment of divine creation. Of course, every one of these assumptions is false and ignorant, both of the discoveries made of, since then and also of how science works. First of all, the moment of divine creation would have been 541 million years ago. And it's not just that the people usually making this argument believe that the Earth is less than 10,000 years old. Even the old Earth creationists still deny evolution and have no way to account for all these unevolving animals over that vast period of time and for people missing from all but the very top of the fossil record. Then there's the fact that these are not modern animals. I mean, there's some recognizable crustaceans, jellyfish, starfish, primitive things like that, but not much else. And as far as precursors, many of these are precursors for things that came later. There are some protochordates early on, but not even the most primitive fish yet. No vertebrates at all. And you see these things with these tentacle looking things sticking up? These are believed to be the ancestors of uh, mollusks. Of course, the precursors they're asking for are Precambrian. We have some of those too. Uh, Darwin predicted that they would eventually find Precambrian fossils. And in later editions of his book, he bragged that they already had. And these fossils are difficult to identify because they're so alien compared to anything still around today. But there are some that do appear to be Ediacaran ancestors of, uh, of Cambrian critters. And some of these are even older than that, dating back to the Vendian period or another 100 million years earlier. So you see, these things did not all appear at the same time. Uh, not even all the phyla are here. Uh, bryozoans, for example, don't appear until the Ordovician period some 60 million years later. And this sudden eruption of different life forms has a very simple explanation. Because evolution is undirected with no understanding or intent, then once protists, single cell protists went multicellular, there was a wealth of different design possibilities and evolution experimented in every direction at once. And that's why they produce so many different designs so very quickly. And that's also why so many of them are extinct now. I'm sure most of the phyla we have today started then, but most of the things we had then, we don't have anymore because many of those experiments failed. As for the speed at which they evolved, 
a, a recent article in Current Biology reports that observed rates of molecular evolution could be reconciled with the divergences between metazoa and phyla as recent as 586 million years ago, which, although still predating the Cambrian, is now broadly congruent with recent discoveries of the earliest metazoans. In other words, ev the evolution at that time was not so impossibly fast as the critics claimed, and it's a reasonable expectation. Remember also that we have trace fossils like uh, worm tunnels and crawling tracks uh, showing the emergence of soft-bodied animals before they developed hard parts, which usually the only bits that fossilize. But you get lucky and get things like this. We have, whoops, there we go. Uh, we have oodles of bacterial microfossils dating back 3.8 billion years. So every creationist claim against the Cambrian explosion is wrong. And that only leaves them one, one last hope. There really is no hope for creationism. And evolution has been proven every way it possibly can be. And every testable claim that creationists make have been proven wrong. Uh, but they don't acknowledge that or ignore it. And instead, quote, where Darwin was wondering why we don't everywhere see innumerable transitional forms. And the simple answer to that is, is we do. Now that we have a better understanding of evolution, we see that you know, species are actually quite fluid, and in a sense, every species is transitional. But creationists think that's cheating. They demand a, a stricter definition, and that's fair. I found this definition. I found a de definition that was accepted both by mainstream scientists and by science-denying young Earth creationists. As a matter of fact, I found this definition on a creationist website that still denies that any transitional species have ever been found, even though I personally have shown them hundreds of examples that meet all of those criteria at once. They simply refuse to admit it. They know that what they're promoting, that what they're teaching, what they're broadcasting is not true. They simply do not care. Now, when I first got into the creation versus evolution or CREVO controversy, uh, it was in a moderated debate with an evangelical minister who admitted in writing that he knew that there were transitional species in the fossil record, but that he wanted to teach students that there were none because he said it was important that they believe that there are none. So he's, he's admitted that he is willing to lie to other people's children to deceive them into believing something he knows is not true. So this is not about understanding any actual truth or the reality the way it is. This is all about make-believe for whatever deceptive, manipulative reason. Now, Darwin made many specific predictions, and some had come true even during his lifetime and many more since then. I could make a whole other presentation just on transitional species, so I, I would rather leave that uh, for the Q&A if anyone is interested. For the moment, I'll only show you one, which is possibly the most important one, for at least to some people. The so-called missing link that was predicted in the 1800s and discovered 40 years ago in 1974. The Australopithecus afarensis, now known as Lucy, was only the first of hundreds of her species to be discovered, all dating between 3.85 and 2.95 million years ago. And that's only one species in what is now a, functional com a functionally complete sequence of over a dozen different species represented by thousands of individuals discovered thus far, all linking apes with men, although we now understand that ape men are actually a subset of apes. So that asking for a half man, half ape is about as ridiculous as asking for a half dachshund, half dog. Now, Lucy lived 3.2 million years ago. And one of the curious features about her is the location of the foramen magnum, which is the hole in the bottom of the skull that the spinal cord goes into. It's moved halfway forward in her, from the human side from the ape side, meaning that the spinal cord goes in from below rather than from behind, the way it does in chimpanzees and gorillas. This is just one of several elements of evidence that indicate that she was a habitual biped and that uh, her type had more recently converted to upright walking. So Lucy proved to be a fully bipedal ape whose hands, feet, teeth, pelvis, skull, 
and other physical details were all exactly halfway between modern people and the apes that were known in Darwin's day. Exactly what the creationists challenged us to find, and they're still pretending we never found it. They won't admit the truth because they don't want to know that. They want to pretend something else. But for those of us unafraid to accept the reality as it is, Darwin's theory has been vindicated as an amazingly comprehensive and cohesive contribution to science with great explanative power, and his creationist critics have done him wrong. Thank you. I got a question for you, Enroll. Name one country, race, whatever, that is purely atheist before the 19th century that built, created, or advanced humankind in any way. I'm talking about a country. I'm talking about a group. Can you 